here we go. So what they're doing here, they're basically asking this the same question twice. They're asking a question about this, what do they call it? Uh, they're asking if this pair is a solution, and then they're asking, is this pair a solution? Right? Okay. So with any any state, any equation, any equality, any inequality, any anything that says x plus y, whatever equals whatever, we're making some kind of a statement that's either true or false. If you plug stuff in and it makes it true, it's a solution. If you plug stuff in and it makes it false, it's not a solution. The thing that might be confusing about this is there's nowhere to put this or this. But that's okay. It just means Y apparently doesn't really matter. All that really matters is that X is greater than negative seven. So with nowhere to put this 10, we only need to really worry about this zero. Is this a solution? Well, zero, plug that in for X. Is this true? Yes. Zero is bigger than negative seven. So this is a solution. Okay, for this one, we plug in negative eight. Negative eight less than negative seven, or sorry, greater than. So is that true? It's not. So this is not a solution. going to give us a y of negative two. negative 2. 0 for y, that's going to give us an x of negative 5. There's our two points, negative 5, 0, 0, negative 2. So, this line is made of points, an infinite number of points. And if I choose any point, that's a part of the line. It's made of an x and a y. It's an x and a y coordinate. If I take that x and that y and I put it here and there, well, if I put them in here and there, what should I get on this side? Negative 10. Because if I choose a point from on the line that's a part of the line, then that x and y should always cause us to get a negative 10 on this side. right? Because those points are the ones that you plug them in, you, the both sides are equal. Right? So like this line, try to color code this thing. This line is just that stuff. The stuff that x and y that makes the left and the right side equal to each other. Agree? Makes sense? Okay. Do we want those points? We do. We do want them to be equal, so we do make it a solid rather than a dotted line. And now we want to figure out what are all the points What are the points that make this side less than that side? Okay. We've done some other examples where y is on one side by itself. Y is greater than. Well, those y's, greater, y's that are greater than otherwise are above. Right? They're above, so we would shade above. Or if y is less than, we shade below. But it's not set up that way. We can set it up that way if we want. We can solve for y and then see which direction to shade. Or, do you remember another way? Plug in a point. Take a point, any point. Which point would you choose? Zero, zero. zero, zero. Any point from anywhere on the graph at all. Anywhere on the plane, really. We choose zero, zero. If it makes it true, we must have picked a point from the shaded area. If it makes it false, we must have picked a point that's not in the shaded area. 
2 times 0 plus 5 times 0. Is that less than or equal to negative 10? Well, we get 0 plus 0 is 0. Is this true or false? False. False. So it's not part of the points that we want. It must be down here. and it looks like there's gaps here. There's not really any gaps. I just don't have time to fill it all the way in. All the points on the line and all the points below the line will make that inequality true. Either a point from the line will make both sides equal or a point from below the line will make the left side smaller than the right side. Good? Questions? Sounds like no? Okay. Next is 20. So which order pair is not a solution? Let's consider this order pair. What does it mean for something to be a solution to this inequality? Makes the inequality true. Makes the inequality true. So if this is a solution, it means So if that point is, a, or if that order pair is a solution, that means that I plug it in for x and y, and it's true, whether this be an inequality, an equation, whatever the thing is, the statement is. If it's a true statement, then what I plugged in was a solution. If I plug it in and it's false, it's not a solution, yeah? What I did for that one is I just graphed the whole thing, uh -huh. and then plotting the points, they all end up pretty far away from the line that this thing is. Like, oh, okay. Let's take a look more close to the line, so that's what I did. So you graph the whole thing, so let's see, we put in zeros for x and y, we get uh, uh, it's for 10 for x, and then there, and negative uh, 6. So we've got this guy, oh, but it should be a dotted line. So if a point lands on the line, that's not going to be a solution. We're going to make both sides equal. And we can choose the 0, 0, right? 0, 0, is 0 less than 30? Yeah, so the shaded region is here. The rest of you are able to see this on the graph. It's got to be pretty obvious. So let's see yeah. if you're right about it being really obvious. 0, 0 clearly is in the shaded region. And then one of them is kind of close, I guess. It's not really. Yeah, it's kind of close. You can just solve that one, but it gets to ah. the points out of the way pretty quick. Okay, negative one seven. You know, it's way up, way up here in the shaded region. Very clear. I think the entire second quadrant is shaded. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it was 
1, negative 7, 1, negative 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Well, negative 6 is the y-intercept, and the line goes up from there, right? So this point would have to be below the line. Anyway, here's negative 5, 5. Multiple 5. I mean, that's even that's still even above the, the y-intercept, so that's in the shaded region for sure. So all these points are pretty clearly in the shaded region. The other one that's only one that's kind of iffy, maybe, just by the, the picture itself, is this guy. And like Brendan said, you can just try it out. Just plug it in, and if it makes it false, then your suspicions were true. And negative one, or sorry, one negative seven is the last solution. Let's try that. Three, one, minus five, negative seven. And that less than 30. We've got three plus 35. That's 38. That's not less than 30. It's false. So definitely not a solution. We're only looking for which ordered pair is not a solution. There's only one. That one clearly is not. So we found it. That's not a solution. Wait, so how did you graph it? I'm just curious about How did I graph it? Okay, so it's very similar to this one. We plug a zero in for x and find y. We put a zero in for y and find x. Did you have, were, you quick, were you good on this one? Said it or any question? I know. Well, yeah. Does this make sense? No. No. It's okay. No, it's fine. Um, like <laughs> this equals two. This the graph of two x plus five y equals negative ten is very helpful because if it's included in the points, then we already have some of the of the points that we want. If it's not included in the points, it's not included in the graph. We're gonna have a dotted line. But we need that dotted line to tell us like where to stop shading, right? So in any case, this equation, or like the graph of this equation, is going to be very helpful. So we've been graphing these kinds of equations for a long time. They're lines. To find uh, or, or to easily graph a line, we just need at least two points. And the way it's set up, if I plug in zero for x, well then this goes away, and I just have five y equals negative ten, and y is negative 2. Right? Easy. Like that. Oh. And then we plug in 0 for y, we get the same thing, and x winds up being negative 5. Okay. And then we pick a point, we test it, see, so when we plug in 0, 0, 0, 0, we get 0 is less than negative 10, which is false. So that point that we pick must be outside of the shaded area, so the shaded area is over here. So we do the same thing here. I just did it really quickly in my head. I said it x is 0, negative 5, y equals 30, so that's going to give me negative 6, so that's the y-intercept. Yeah. And then uh, 30 divided by 3 is 10, so that's the x-intercept. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so that was 21. So now we're on to 1.7, number 10. So y is a number. Y is some number, so that when I take the absolute value of that number, I get negative 5. What number are you going to take the absolute value when we get negative 5? No, they're not. It's not possible. The absolute value is the distance from 0, and the distance from 0 is always a positive number. So we have no solution. That was easy. 10? Yeah? So uh, with the absolute value, if you have a negative, like that equals a negative number, it's no solution. Yep. Right. Either you say no solution, or if you are like if you were like trying out solutions to see if they work, then they don't work, because you can't get an absolute value to be a negative number. You can have a negative inside. When you take the absolute value, you can't wind up getting a negative number. This defies the definition of the absolute value. Um, so that was 10, and on to 22. So, if I were to find a G to plug in, or a number to plug in for G, 
And I did all of this did calculations there, and I came out with seven inside the absolute value, the absolute value of seven, seven. Okay, so there was some other value of g somewhere, somewhere else, and I plug it in there, and I wind up getting negative seven inside the absolute value. It'll also be seven. That's why we say that if this, this step inside the absolute value comes out to be seven, that works. Or if that step inside the absolute value comes out to be negative seven. If I plug something in for g and all that stuff comes out to be negative seven, the absolute value is also seven. We solve both. 3g equals negative seven, g equals negative seven thirds. 3g equals negative 21, g equals negative seven. yourself, plug in negative 7, negative 21 plus 14 is negative 7, the absolute value of negative 7 is 7. Put negative 7 thirds in there, the threes cancel, you get negative 7 plus 14, negative 7 plus 14 is 7, the absolute value of 7 is 7. All I'm doing there is plugging those values for g that we just solved for back into the original equation. They had better work, otherwise you did something wrong. The only reason it wouldn't work in this case is because you did something wrong. Outside of the absolute value, it's not in the absolute value. You have to check your solutions. Maybe something will, won't work. We're going to do some work. We're going to find two numbers, and here are the possibilities. Both numbers work. Only one number works, or both numbers don't work. Definitely a possibility. We definitely have to check that when we're on that. If this stuff is the same as this stuff, so the absolute value of the one side equals the other side, as long as x is a positive number. But if all this stuff comes out to be the opposite of x, as long as x is a positive number, then we take the absolute value of it and we still get positive. It's a positive version of x. What we get in here is x, and the absolute value of that would be whatever x is, as long as x is positive. If all this stuff comes out to be the opposite of x, well, the absolute value of the opposite of x would be x, as long as x is positive. Uh, let's see. solutions might not work is related to what I kept saying over and over, as long as x is positive, as long as this side of the equation, the stuff that the absolute value is equal to, is positive. If it winds up being negative over here, it's like we talked about before. Oh, there it was. Impossible for the absolute value of something to be a negative number. In the case that we're working on right now, they're both going to work because if I plug 2 in here, <coughs> x is 2, can the absolute value of something be positive 2? Yeah, and you can bet that what's inside of the absolute value will be 2 or negative 2. It'll be one of those. It'll actually be 2. It'll be exactly equal to x. And when I plug this guy in there, right, separate test, well, can the absolute value of something be positive 1? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see if we can even do all the work. 3x, 3, 3 times uh, 1 minus 4. Does that equal 1? Well, we get 3 minus 4. Absolute value of negative 1. Is that equal to 1? Oh, yes, it is. And that's the case where x is 1, so it's inside of it would be the opposite of 1, because that's how we set it up in the first place. Yes? So if one of the numbers was, or if it came out that one of, like, say the x came out to be like a and, and there could be more.
more stuff over here on this other side. But whatever it is, once we get all done figuring out what it would be when x is whatever, if this comes out to be negative, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily be no solutions, but it would be that this isn't a solution. But in this case, they both work. They're both solutions. We have two solutions to this equation. If you tried both of them, they could both not work, and they would have no solution. That is possible. What was that? 34 and Absolute value of x is greater than three. Let's just talk about that real quick. Um, well, x is greater than three. Will this equation be true? Does this inequality be true? If x is four, five, six, seven, eight and a half, twelve and three quarters. Okay. And the absolute value of twelve and three quarters will be twelve and three quarters, and that will be bigger than three. Right? Okay. So x could be some negative numbers, right? What kind of negative numbers can X be? Negative four. Negative four. Negative five. Six. Negative a hundred. Negative a thousand. Right? Negative three? No, because then the absolute value would be equal to what's that? <coughs> negative three hundred. How about negative two? No. No. So X has to be like negative three is like the cutoff, right? So does x have to be in relation to negative 3? Less than. Less than. It's got to be less than negative 3, right? The yeah. stuff inside the absolute value needs to be negative 3. Well, it needs to be actually just to the left of negative 3. It's got to be less than negative 3. So if x is bigger than 3, if it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever, then the absolute value of that will be bigger than 3. If x is negative 4, negative 5, negative 6, negative 7, the absolute value of all those numbers is also bigger than 3. Before we do anything else, let's just go ahead and give it a this pretty clear. Make sure that we have the absolute value by itself. So this stuff, all of this stuff inside of the absolute value, if it comes out to be greater than or equal to 8, then of course, any number that is 8 or bigger, the absolute value of that is going to be 8 or bigger. Or, this stuff is less than or equal to negative 8. Okay, so this stuff would be negative 8, or negative 9, or negative 10, or negative 35, or negative 300. Right? Any of those, when you take the absolute value, will also be bigger than 8. 2 fifths n is greater than or equal to 16, multiplied by 5 halves, n is greater than or equal to 40. Is both sides and two fifths n will be less than or equal to zero, so n is less than or equal to zero. It asks us to graph it. We start with well zero and forty, so we never even have zero here. We're forty way over here. Let's go to zero. Can it be equal to zero? Can it be equal to zero? Yeah, it can be. So we'll fill it in. And it also could be less than zero, so we'll shade that in. 40, it could be equal to 40, so we'll shade it in. And it could be bigger than 40. Definitely still, or n can be this, or it can be that. Greater than or equal to 40, or less than or equal to zero. that occurred to you as we were talking? And let's pass them over. The graph's inequality, like I said, no matter what, this equation, the graph of this equation is 
really helpful because it's, it's a cutoff for the y values that are either going to, well, the y values that we want that are going to be less than 3x plus 3. If we want the y values that are less than this expression for any given x, then we should know probably where the cutoff is, where the y's that are equal to uh, this expression for any given x. So that would be this graph right here, the graph of that equation, which is the line. It's pretty easy to graph. It has y intercept of 3, meaning that if I plug in 0 for x, I get 3 for y. Pretty clear. And then what x should I go to? It doesn't really matter. I can move over 1. The denominator of this guy is just 1. Plug in 1 for x. Draw a dotted line because I don't want those y values. I don't want the y values that are going to make the both sides equal, but the y values that will make it unequal. I want the y values that are less than 3x plus 3. The y values that are equal to 3x plus 3 are these y values, the y values all along this line. I choose this x value, plug in that x, I will get exactly this y. Plug in this x, I'll get exactly this y right here. Where do I find the y values that are less than 3x plus 3 y values? Below that line. Below that line. Everything on the line. Just so it's clear, say if I go to an x of 2. Trying to solve, which means find all the solutions. It means find anything for k that will make the equation true. So generally when we say solve the equation, it would be the same thing as saying find the solutions, all the solutions. Uh, when, we, when we solve an equation, if it's possible to have multiple values for k, then we should find all of them. That's it, because either this stuff is equal to 21 or this stuff inside the absolute value is equal to negative 21. Those are the only two numbers that you take the absolute value of and get 21. So you need to include them both. Should we test them out and see if they work? Don't need to. Don't need to. How do we know we don't need to? If k is only on one side of the equation, and that's in the absolute value. It's in the absolute value. That's very important. Maybe. Yeah. 
moving forward that's inside the absolute value. It's outside the absolute value, now things become iffy. And we need to check it out. We need to check our solutions. If all the, the variables are inside the absolute value, then we need to check. If you check anyway, it couldn't hurt anything. It's just you're going to find that they're always true. As long as all your math is correct. How about this one? Are we going to need to check our solutions at the end of this one? Yeah, there's an x on the other side. What if we put something in for x that gives the right side to be negative? Well, that wouldn't be good. That wouldn't be possible. So we do need to check that out. So 3x plus 2 could be exactly the same as 2x minus 12. Or 3x plus 2 be equal to the exact opposite of 2x minus 12. Solve, so subtract 2x from both sides, we get x, subtract 2 from both sides, we get negative 14. There's a possibility, but we're going to need to check that out here in a second. I'm just going to go ahead and find the solution for this equation 2. I'm going to distribute the negative, so we get negative 2x plus 12. 2x, we get 5x. So we'll subtract 12 from both sides. There's 2 from both sides, we get 10. x equals 2. So we need to check both of those solutions to see if they work. What do we find out when we check both those solutions? Mitch? There's no solution. There's no solution. Neither one of them work. Both of them give us negatives on the right side. Just, if you got that one wrong, hopefully it reminds you, it sends the message that it's possible for both of these solutions not to work possible to get no solutions at all. So if I get negative 14, now I get negative 28 minus 12. It's definitely negative. It's negative minus a negative. But 2, 2 times 2 is a positive 4. That's good. But minus 12, that's still negative. Not working. If you have questions asked, if you don't, pass the quizzes back after you score them. notation and forget exactly what it means. So we'll quickly go over uh, what it is and why we would even invent it. Why did history bear out this function notation? Well, before function notation, there was y is equal to 2x minus 4, not f of x is equal to 2x minus 4. It's just a letter to represent what the output of the function is. So we've got another function that also would say y equals negative 3 fourths x that's fine. That's also y equals. It's a little misleading because is that y or is this y? You know what I mean? This y is different from that y. So which one is y? Which one is the y? I have a third function. y is equal to 5 eighths x minus 6. The third thing we're calling y. Right? How do I find what y is? It's kind of misleading to call these things why when they're all different. It's like kind of the beginning of why would you use function notation. So if I stand over here, I stand over here and I say uh, plug in uh, 4 for x in the function. Do you have any questions for me? No. When I say that, plug in, plug in 4 for x. Which function are we plugging in? Which, Which function? So that's one thing about function notation that helps us distinguish one function from another function. Uh, what are some ways, if we didn't have function notation, or if we were the first person to notice that this is an issue, what are some ways we could tell one function from another function? Right? Graph it. OK, if you graph it, but then there's three graphs rather than three equations, and how do I, how do I say, you know, distinguish one graph from another graph? OK. Okay, so now we'll put little numbers on there, x1, x2, x3, that's, a, that, that's something that could work. Brent? If you looked at the slope, then you would know that that was y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2, and yeah. then you could basically see which on top and on bottom was the slope, and then you could 
plug in the Y intercept and you technically would be able to find it. I think maybe you're missing my question. I'm just asking, if I say plug in 4 for X, how can I make sure you know which function I'm talking about? I say plug in 4 for X, you can plug in 4 for X into any three of them. Oh. Any of the three, right? How do I tell you that one, that one, or that one? Um, label each of the functions, so that could be function one, function two, and okay. three. Okay, so a one with a circle around it, a two with a circle, a three with a circle around it, so now I've got functions one, two, and three. That could work. Maybe with the numbers, I don't know, could be a little confusing. That certainly is better than them all being y, and it's hard to tell which is which. Any other ideas? We uh, make them different colors. Does that work? Red one, the blue one, the yellow one, sure. But who walks around with a bunch of colored pencils in their pocket? Not many people do. You could say plug in X to the one with the Y intercept of negative four. Okay, certainly. The one with the Y intercept of negative four. We're gonna have a little bit of an issue if, if we have two functions with the Y intercept of negative four, but so far, yeah. yeah, that would work, right? And so all of these ways are perfectly good ways. Now, which way actually got accepted by most people who do math. None of those ways got accepted by most of the people who do math. The way that we have all come to distinguish one function from another is to give the, the output part of it a different name. Okay? When it comes out, it's called well, no longer y. It's called something else. So for this function, let's just start from left to right. Instead of calling it y, this stuff that comes out, call this output f, this output is g, this output is h. And we could choose anything we want. I mean, we could use y, but uh, it's function notation, so we typically will give the default f function, f for function. And why g? Because what well, comes after f, and why h? Because it comes after g. We had 26 functions, we could use 26 letters, well, we don't want to use x. So 25 letters, okay, theoretically. And we could get creative if we want to be on that. Okay. So that's the first thing about function notation, is it gives every function its own name. So if, yes? What if there is more than 25 functions? Okay, what if there is more than 25 functions? It's a great question. If there were more than 25 functions, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you see yeah. that when people name things A, B, C, D, then you get to Z and they go A, A, B, B, yeah. C, C, you could do that. Uh, if we had to work with more than 25 functions at one time, that'd be really weird, that'd be very strange. But yeah, I think you, you're, you're getting at uh, like what we would want to do to solve that problem. We would want to just come up with more names, somehow come up with more names. Maybe we could go with capital letters, lots of different ways we can go. But typically we'll work with maybe three functions at a time. So really we just need like three different names. F, G, and H are the popular ones. Um, just if, uh, so th there's these functions called rational functions. Rational numbers are, are fractions, so rational functions are ones that do one function over another. So when I have one function over another function. I'm just showing you sometimes we choose the names for functions in a way that makes sense. Okay. Uh, a lot of times we'll call this one n of x and this one d of x. So you don't even have to worry about the x part. Call this one n and this one d. Why do you think we call them n? Numerators and numerators and not. Exactly. Uh, See, if I take n of x and I divide it by d of x, and I like, actually do that division and, and figure out what that's equal to, I'll call that a lot of times q of x. Why q? The quotient. The quotient, right? Quotient is, is the name you give something that is the result of division. If I divide two things and call that result the quotient. 
So just to show you that in a different context, we'll call functions by a name that makes sense in the context. We might even have q of x plus r of x. So that would just be the remainder. Right? There's a remainder of the r. Anyway, we'll get rid of all that just to show you how we name functions from time to time. So there you go, different names. And while we're at it, upsetting everything we've ever known about functions, calling them y, and now we're calling them fg and h and so on. Go ahead and throw this of x on there. Of x. I'm going to change this one so you can see how it might look a little different. If this is t, we can call this h of t. So that parentheses with a letter in there, what is that telling us about the function? It's of, the of that. What does it mean to be of that? What does it mean to be a function? It's a function. It's a function of that. Yes, it is actually. What's that? No, that's the one thing that I want to make clear today is that we're not. It's not taking h times t. H of t. H is a function of t. What does that mean? I don't know. What? Brennan? That means, is that what the slope is? No. Is that the slope? The slope is. Like a variable that's in the x and t is in that function? Not necessarily that I'm trying to find it, but. But it does, I mean, you, you will notice that this t, if you see t here, there's a t there. Mitch, h is the output of t. Well, h, when you say of t, uh, how do I say this? When I, when I say it's the output of the function, we'll still say of f. The function is called f. So the output of the function would be the output of f, or the output of g, or the output of h. Right? When we talk about the function like it's a, a thing or a person, we call it by its name h, g, f, right? Um, well, it is a part of the function. It's the input part of the function. That's all this means. Okay. So this parentheses, you know, a parentheses is begging to have something in it, right? Does that make sense? Parentheses contain stuff. It wants something in there. So what's in there? The input. The input is in parentheses. Okay. So that if I said f of 2, what would you think that means? The input is 2. The input is 2. So what does it mean? Like, what am I supposed to do now? Find the so output. Right. Find the output. How do I find the output? Use 1, 2, and the function. Which one? Of f, yes, f is it's this one. f is this function, and clearly I want the input of f to be 2. So f of 2 is 2 times 2 minus 4, 4 minus 4, 0. Done. We bound the output, just like Braxton said. We want to find the output. What was the input? 6. And what was the output? 0. zero. f of 2 is zero, and we are done, okay? If you're thinking that you should divide yeah. by two and say f is zero, no. You're not trying to solve for f, it's not f times two. And I know that's confusing, I agree that it looks like, in another context, that would be f times two, that's what it means, f times two. But in, in function notation, it doesn't mean multiply, it just means the function's called f, and whatever you see in here is the input. Right now, the input is just called x, and right now the input is very specific, it's specifically to Braxton. So does the, the function notation sort of take away like the whole like table and organizing yeah. here function? Yeah, it's another way to organize the information. So we don't have to, like if I have an x and y table, think about it. If I tell you that x is, is not related to this one, I'm just making up this table, you know, unrelated. I tell you x is 7 and y is 5. Well, I still need to then write, write down the function y equals, I don't 
know, something that turns seven into five. Okay, maybe it's x plus, uh, or x, sorry, x minus two. Maybe that's it. Okay. So there's kind of a, a lot of stuff to write down, but in this case I can say that f of two is zero. And yeah, so it's just like Braxton said, it's a different way to say this. f of two is zero, meaning that if I put two into f, I get zero f. So does it also help like when you're graphing multiple lines, you can label them differently? Yeah. So you could just put f next to a line, b next to a line, and x next to a line? Exactly. That happens a lot because we want to know which is which in my area. I'm going to graph these really quickly. So we got a y-intercept of negative 4, slope of 2. There's that. What's that? That's f of x. Or you might see just the letter F. That definitely is enough to tell me which line belongs to which function. Uh, negative 5, slope of 3, and over 42, 4. Nope. This one is G. And uh, negative 6, slope of 5 eighths. Y of X, yeah, okay. Y of X. Um, and, you know, if we go back to the old style of, of functions, yeah, if we, if we go back to a function Y equals, like Y equals 2X minus 24, I could say Y of 7. Just make sure that person understands. I'm talking about function notation. I'm not talking about take y and multiply it by 7. If I wanted to take y and multiply it by 7, I would do 7y. That would be different. Or this way. But yeah, exactly. All right, so here's what I want you to do just to make sure we're all on the same page so far. I want you to find a couple of things. I want you to find h of negative 15 and g of 24. Find those two. Okay. When I say h of negative 16, what does that mean? Plug in negative 16 for t in a function that's named h. A function that's named h, plug in negative 16. 5 eighths times negative 16, 1, 6, that's 11. 2, 6, 5 times negative 2, 6, it's negative 16. So it just so happens when we put a negative 16 into H, we get out negative 16. Coincidence. 24G of 24 means what? Plug in 24 into function G. Negative 3, 4, 
minus times 24 over 1. Should be 2. Times 5. Uh, you just multiply this out. 3 times 24, negative 3 times 24 is negative. 72. 4 minus 5. 72 is divisible by 4. Do that. If you cross 4 and 24, you get 6, 6 times negative 3, negative 18. That works too. Yeah. Negative 23. So g of 24 is negative 23, and we're done. So whenever you get to g of 24, or anything that looks like this, Again, I'm not going to divide by 24 to figure out what g is. g of 24 is saying something. It's saying that the output of the function g, when you put in 24, the output is negative 23. And you do not want to divide and figure out what g is because it does not make any sense. And it's not g times 24, it's g of 24. I Meaning you plug in 24 into g and see what comes out. Yeah, I always like get these on like the best we get at the beginning of the year for like math, and I'm like, I don't even know what this yeah, is. Yeah, I was like, I have, I, I have no clue how to do with functions. So. Yeah. Yeah, we well, if, if you've never seen it, I mean, yeah, it, would, yeah. it wouldn't make any sense. Or if you, if it's been a while since you saw it, well, then it's a good time, a good thing we took some time to talk about what it means exactly. So, so one thing is that it gives the functions a name. The other thing is that it uh, kind of makes directions easy, right? It makes it it makes it easy to tell you what I want you to do with the function. When we have h parentheses t, right? parentheses a number goes there, it makes directions easy. Directions easier because before think about if all these said y, y equals two x minus four, y equals negative three fourths x minus five. So to get you to do what I want you to do, like before function notation, I would have to say uh, plug 24 into the x of y equals the second one, or, or just tell you what it is, y equals negative 3 fourths x minus 5, when it's already written down. You could reference it if I had a name. Now it does. But it would just take a lot of words say we want to say, but once we have this function notation, we all agree what it means, it makes it easier. You say g of 24, it says all of that in just a few pen strokes. Another thing, what do you think this means? Can I get rid of all of this and write down f of x, of x equals Okay, the output is 10. So, so we then, the input. what's that? So we need to find the input. So we need to find the input. We need to find the input. So we know what the output is, we need to find what the, what the input was, in a sense. Okay? So f of x, that's this function right here. What did I put into it? I, I don't know, but I know whatever I do put into it, I'll put in here, 2x minus 4, and get out 10. And I just figure out what x is. The input was. And so it must be 7. Right? Add 4, 14 divided by 2, x is 7. I said, now I know that. What is f of 7? What's f of 7? 10. It's 10. Clearly, because I just, yeah. I just told you it was 10. I found the input, f of 7 is 10. The input, if you put 7 in there, you get 10.
function notation is something we really need to have a grasp on before we can talk about what we're going to talk about now, which is piecewise piece wise define functions how do you figure these functions are defined? in pieces in pieces, piecewise we throw that wise on the end of things that we just want to be like oh piecewise or this day is really nice weather wise but not I don't know, otherwise so piecewise just means it's defined in pieces. How are we going to cut a function into pieces? We're going to cut its domain into pieces. That means its input, the x values, or whatever the input's called, and cut that into pieces. So here's what a piecewise defined function would look like. Standard default f of x function is equal to, put this little bracket there, because it's going to collect stuff, right? Kind of funnel it into f of x. So a piecewise divided function might look like 3 fourths x minus 6 if x is less than or equal to negative 4. See, this is the extra bit. We normally don't say that. We don't say if x is something. It's just x is whatever you want it to be. But now we're saying, well, some x's will use this function and some other x's say these x's, x's that are greater than negative 4, use some other function. Which function? The function that I make up right now, just out of whim. This one? Yeah. No, because if I want to use negative 4, if I want to use x as negative 4, and I put equals 2 here too, which one do I use? I x is, negative, is equal to negative 4 here and here, so which way do I go? And that's one thing about piecewise defined functions. Like if you see this, and you have negative four, well it could be here and it could be here, then whoever wrote it down wrote it down wrong. Piecewise defined functions need to be, there can't be any overlap. There might be gaps, right? I could make this uh, greater than or equal to uh, negative two, and that'd work. Now what do I do for, for negative four to negative two? Apparently not, apparently there is no output. That, that can happen. We say the function's not defined, right? At negative two to negative four. But if we back it up and they say from negative infinity all the way to negative four, use that function. Once you get past negative four, get bigger than negative four, use this function, whichever one I decide. I'll decide to let it be um, 3x plus one. There's my piecewise defined function. I just made it all up. All of it is made up. The thing about this that, that makes it a piecewise function is that instead of just being 3 fourths x minus 6, and that's the function, or instead of just being 3x plus 1, it's 3 fourths x minus 6 for some of it, for some values of x, and it's 3x plus 1 for other values of x. And we could we could cut a function into 3, 4, 5, 6 pieces. In this case, we just cut it into two pieces. Yeah. Will that turn into a line graph or a graph of a line? Well, we know that this will be a line, right? Yeah. And this will be a line. And if they have to like meet up at negative four, sure. I know they're not going to meet up and make a line because this one has a slope of three fourths. This one has a slope of three. Even yeah. if they touch, they're not going to make a straight line. There will be a line. It won't be able to be graphed, right? Number lines? Yeah. They'll be able to be graphed. Oh, be a line graph like a, like a number line? Yeah, both, like a number line and a graph. Oh. Well, we could graph the x values on a, on a number line. Well, think about it, like, remember how we talked about we have two number lines yeah. for particular. Here's the number line for the, for the x values. This for a second, we don't have to get this detailed every time, but why not? We've run it up. Okay. So for x is less than or equal to negative 4, here's negative 4, right? And it could be less than or equal to. So for all of these x values, on those ones, I will use this function. This is the function that will exist. This is the function that will decide what the output is. For these other 
x values, right, where it's like at 4 but not equal to 4 and beyond there, I'll use this function. This function will decide what the output's going to be. So you can just kind of cut a, I mean, graphing these values out in number line, like sort of open circle, closed circle, shading, we don't really need to worry about all that for, for this. We really want to look at, well, this line is going to be somewhere on the plane, this line is going to be somewhere on the plane, and they're just kind of, kind of meet up at x is negative 4. Okay. Some of it's going to be over here, one, one line's going to be over here, or the other line's going to be over there, and they, they may even meet up nicely, they may not. They may, one may come up here and one may go down there. That's just what that one looks like. Okay. Yeah. So you can find it. Yeah, we can find what that graph will look like. Just go ahead and clear that back out. That's still negative four. Okay, so let's before we graph it, let's start off easy. Let me just ask you this. What's f of On this screen, if I said f of 2, you would just go look at the function f, and you put 2 right in there. That'd be it. But here I have to, well, f of x is two different functions. Do I just plug 2 in here and in here, and then just see like what those two outputs are? No, if it's since 2 is less than or equal to, or oh, greater than negative 4, uh -huh. you would just put it in that. Yeah, function. exactly. That, this, this x is greater than x is less than stuff, it just tells you which function to use. Yeah, so if whatever x is, it has to be determined. Yeah. Uh, okay. So whatever the x is, first you look here, well, wh which one am I supposed to use? Well, it depends on the x's. So, well, x is bigger than negative 4 in this case because x is 2. 2 is bigger than negative 4, so I'll use this function. What about, so that's going to be 3 times 2 plus 1. That's the function. F of negative 8. That's the top one. The top one, because that's less than negative 4. Negative 8 is less than negative 4. So I'll do 3 fourths times negative 8 over 1 minus 6 and whatever that is. What about F of negative 4? The top one. That's the part that has the equals to it. So when I get to negative 4, that's the guy, that's still your guy. Okay, 3 fourths <coughs> and negative 4 over 1 minus 6. And then oh, that's 0, that's that's negative 12. The top function. Oh, 3 times 2 at the bottom. That's 6. Okay, so in this case, f of 2 is 6 plus 1, that's 7. f of negative 8, that's 7. That cancels that. But Leaves the negative two, so three times negative two, negative six, negative twelve. Four is cancel. Negative three, negative six, negative nine. All day long, I could give you f of seven, f of twelve, f of negative twelve, f of negative sixteen, and you just decide which function it goes into, and you plug it into that function. That makes sense. Well, now for the graph, the decision is the same. Okay. If I'm going to graph, say this function, 3x plus 1, where do I graph it? Well, for these x values. From here, m greater, I'll use this graph. Okay. The graph's pretty easy. It's got a y-intercept of 1. It's got a slope of 3. Back this way too, down three to the left one, down three to the left one, down three to the left one, until we get to the cutoff point. X is negative four, then it stops. And it is not the function we use when X is negative four. So what, is, what does that mean? We'll put an open circle there on the end of that line. Once we get to negative four, when we're at negative four, this is the function we use. So to figure that out, you it's up to you. What I would do, I know that I need to be at x is negative 4. 
want to figure out what that y value is, and I'll follow the slope from there, the slope of 3 fourths. I already did that. F of negative 4 is negative 9. Let's see. How does that wind up? Let's see. This is down 3, so this is negative 2. This is negative 5. This is negative 8. So negative 9 is right there. Okay. See what I'm saying? This line right here at negative 4. X is negative 4. Y is negative 9, just like we found right here. And from that point, we should be able to follow the slope. Slope 3 fourths. So we'll go down 3, and to the left 4. Call that. Call it good. And it is the function that goes to the left. If we wanted, we could do three functions, four functions, five functions. We just need to piece out the x's in a perfect partition, which means there's no overlap. No overlap. So I could do for x is less than negative 2, then I could do between negative 2 and 5, and then from 5 to 8, and then for x is bigger than 8. Right? Four different pieces, whatever, whatever you decide. Looks if you're kind of daunting and intimidating, but all it means is first, which x are you trying to plug into this function? Find where you're supposed to, which where your x lands, and then use the appropriate piece of the function. That is all. So the homework is that bit from page 131, but I'll obviously I'll make sure it goes out today via remind. Is that the end of the last